A reunited Germany will dominate a soon-to-be-resurrected Holy Roman Empire. That was Herbert W. Armstrong's keynote prophecy, one he stated even as the flames from World War II smoldered amid the rubble of German cities. The rise of this German-led United States of Europe, as he termed it, would immediately precede the catastrophic events Jesus Christ discussed in Matthew 24. Mr. Armstrong delivered his forecast for Europe for decades, consistently and in detail. Right up until his death in January 1986, he never stopped sending that warning message. He also warned that a massive financial crisis centered in America would ripple across the whole world and would spark the rise of the seventh and final resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. In light of recent events, that forecast truly is impressive, not to mention an undeniable testament to Mr. Armstrong's matchless grasp of Bible prophecy. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. The world is fixated on the turmoil in Europe, but while many are looking, very few actually understand what they are witnessing. Consider what's happened recently with Italy and Greece. With Greece's government in turmoil and the future of Europe at stake, Eurozone officials swooped in to issue a number of demands. Rather than leave the decision of who should lead Greece to Greek voters in a national election, European elites, using bailout money as leverage, commanded Athens to form a national unity government. It's important that we understand what's happening here. Greece is a sovereign nation of 11 million people and, or so we've been led to believe, a valued member of the European community. But over the last few weeks, European elites have blackmailed Athens into foregoing a democratic election, establishing a unity government, and then agreeing to pass into Greek law a series of harsh, transformative rules that were created in Brussels. And in Italy, the story is strikingly similar. Berlin and Brussels maneuvering to oust Prime Minister Berlusconi and installing an unelected puppet regime that will bow before German elites. These are remarkable developments that few people understand. I'd like to show you a short speech recently given by Nigel Farage, a British politician and member of European Parliament. As you'll see from the excerpt, Farage is very much against the union of European nations and is a strong proponent of UK independence. Here's what he said during a speech on November 16th within the European Parliament. Well, here we are, on the edge of a financial and social disaster, and in the room today we have the four men who were supposed to be responsible. And yet we've listened to the dullest, most technocratic speeches I've ever heard. You are all in denial. By any objective measure, the euro is a failure. And who is actually responsible? I mean, who's in charge out of you lot? Well, of course, the answer is none of you, because none of you have been elected. None of you actually have any democratic legitimacy for the roles that you currently hold within this crisis. And into this vacuum, albeit reluctantly, has stepped Angela Merkel. And we are now living, we are now living in a German-dominated Europe, something that the European project was actually supposed to stop. Something that those that went before us actually paid a heavy price in blood to prevent. I don't want to live in a German-dominated Europe, and nor do the citizens of Europe. But you guys have played a role. Because when Mr Papandreou got up and used the word referendum, or Mr Wren, you described it as a breach of confidence, and your friends here got together like a pack of hyenas, rounded on Papandreou, 
had him removed and replaced by a puppet government. What an absolutely disgusting spectacle that was. And not satisfied with that, you decided that Berlusconi had to go. So he was removed and replaced by Mr Monti, a former European Commissioner, a fellow architect of this Euro disaster, and a man who wasn't even a member of the Parliament. It's getting like an Agatha Christie novel, where we're trying to sort of work out who's the next person that's going to be bumped off. The difference is we know who the villains are. You should all be held accountable for what you've done. You should all be fired. And I have to say, Mr Van Rompuy, 18 months ago when we first met, um, I was wrong about you. I said you'd be the quiet assassin of nation-state democracy, but you're not anymore. You're rather noisy about it, aren't you? You, an unelected man, went to Italy and said this is not the time for elections, but the time for actions. What in God's name gives you the right to say that to the Italian people? It's a pretty sobering look inside a very undemocratic union of nations, a union that is being rocked by one financial earthquake after another, and in the midst of it all, clearly, clearly, there's one dominant power that has risen to the top. In an editorial on November the 8th, the Daily Mail warned that increasingly it appears we are witnessing the death of democracy and the right of sovereign nations inside the Eurozone to govern their own affairs. In other words, the ruthless ambitions of European elites are finally being exposed. The European Union has no interest in protecting the sovereign European states or in defending the rights of the European people. Rather, just as the trumpet has repeatedly warned, the EU is an undemocratic, German-led powerhouse engaged in a strategy to conquer, then subjugate, the sovereign states of Europe. Now this is something, as I said, the trumpet has been talking about for years, just looking at the last uh, few years of some of the trumpet covers that we've had, this one, the most recent cover, Germany dominates Europe again. It's happening again. History is repeating itself. Just a couple of years ago, we wrote, is Germany's new Charlemagne about to appear? And we've got a little bit more to say about that in just a second. Actually, we didn't say it. It was in another publication about the spirit of Charlemagne being revived. And then hear this from 2009, Germany, save us. That's what all of Europe is looking to, Germany, to save the continent, to save their economy. Now Farage, in that speech you just saw, says that Germany is reluctantly taking the wheel in Europe. But really, it's, it's much more sinister and calculated than even he realizes. It's actually a well-orchestrated plan to take over Europe. And it happens to be prophesied in your Bible. That's why we've been writing about it for so many years now. We are witnessing the economic colonization of Europe by stealth by the Germans. That's what the Daily Mail wrote on November the 8th. In the past, it continued, it would have taken an invading military force to topple the leadership of a European nation. Today, it can be done through sheer economic pressure. Think about how alarming that statement really is. That's from the Daily Mail. That's coming out in headlines now. Something that, as I said at the top of the program, that Mr. Armstrong was talking about even at the end of World War II. And he talked about it for the length of his 50-year ministry. And we've continued right on with that same message since 1990. In an article on November 4th, Archbishop Cranmer, who writes one of the top political blogs in Britain, reminded us of some crucial history that relates directly to what we're seeing happen right now. He said the German-led European Union is essentially the recreation of the old empire of Charlemagne. The EU today, he explained, has picked up the mantle of Charlemagne, just like Otto the Great did in the 10th century, then the Habsburg kings in the Middle Ages, and then Napoleon again in the early 19th century. Here again, this is something that we've been writing about for many years. At the end of today's program, by the way, we're going to offer you this free booklet 
Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. You can see the image of Charlemagne right there on the cover. This is something we've been talking about for decades. If you go back all the way to the ministry of Herbert W. Armstrong, the spirit of Charlemagne still broods, Cranmer wrote. There is more to come, he warned, as the same fate will befall Portugal, Italy, and Spain for the powerfully federalist character of this project has yet to be appreciated. The spirit of Charlemagne is alive and well in Europe today. Can you appreciate what we're now witnessing? While the world's fixated on currency exchanges or bond yields, all these bailout packages you hear about in the news, or the stock market, what the stock market's doing, Look at what's happening behind the scenes, in Europe in particular. The European continent is being systematically conquered by an invigorated, empowered German nation. That's what's happening. Let's notice Daniel 7. We'll turn to prophecy and see how that God was talking about this not just centuries ago, millennia ago. Now, if you know anything about Bible prophecy, you know that Daniel 2 gives us the big overview of prophecy in that chapter, the great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw uh, represented four successive world ruling kingdoms. And history, secular history, has proven these to be the Chaldean Empire, which was followed by the Persian Empire, then the Greco Macedonian Empire, and then finally, finally, the Roman Empire. These four were to continue, it says in Daniel 2, right up until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, here in Daniel 7, the prophet describes four beasts. Again, they represent these four Gentile kingdoms. But in Daniel 7, he places special emphasis on the fourth beast, that Roman Empire, the fourth and final empire, to be on the scene when Jesus Christ returns. Notice Daniel 7 in verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. Now you can read the previous verses which speak of those first three beasts, but here it speaks of the fourth one, one that was dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. I mean its strength was even greater than the previous three, and that's also brought out in the prophecy in Daniel 2, uh, that great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. Here it's likened to this great beast, it says, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this represented that Roman Empire, as I said, that came to world power, or, world, or began to dominate the world about 30 uh, B.C., and then continued for about five centuries, until it was finally crushed in A.D. 476. But notice, notice verse 7 there talks about this empire or this kingdom having ten horns, and we let the Bible interpret itself. If you drop down to verse 24, notice what it says, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings, or ten kingdoms, it could read, that shall arise. So this fourth beast was to have ten resurrections, or there were to be ten kings that would rise out of that fourth system in succession down through the ages, leading us right up to the return of Jesus Christ. That's the significance of these verses when put together. But notice another very important fact brought out in Bible prophecy. Go back to verse 8, following right after verse 7, which we read. It says, I considered the horns, those ten horns, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, it says, were the eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Here is one of the most revealing verses in the book of Daniel, really in all the Bible. And it has everything to do with what we see happening in Europe. It's really a, a verse about European history, particularly those last seven resurrections of the Roman Empire. This little horn represents a great false church headquartered in Rome, that was to pluck up by the roots those first three systems that really weren't Roman, and then to unite with those final seven systems, 
that would arise right out of the heart of Europe in this church-state combine. That's what we've seen happen down through history. And here again, if you get our booklet, which we'll offer at the end of the program, call the number that we put up on the screen and ask the operators for Germany and the Holy Roman Empire and read about these seven systems because we're about to witness, in fact, we are witnessing the seventh and final resurrection. It's happening. That's the significance of all these headlines that we're now seeing. It's everything that Mr. Armstrong was talking about decades and decades ago. And now we see it happening. That little horn grew in there among the ten horns, pulled up the first three by the roots, and then, and then, really gained control or held power or sway over those seven resurrections. We don't have time to go through uh, Revelation 13 verses 11 through 18, which likens this false religious system to a lamb, which looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And then over in Revelation 17, you see the beast there being straddled by this woman, a church in other words. That's what that symbolizes in prophecy, a woman straddling the beast. You're, you're probably familiar with these images, but why don't more people believe them today? I mean, even a, a couple centuries ago, more people believed these basics of Bible prophecy, but not today. You rarely even hear about it. And here we're seeing this final resurrection of the beast power forming in Europe. It's happening before us. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. It's easy to just focus primarily on, uh, on Germany as being like the engine of this European combine, and it is like the engine, but you can be sure, and we know this, and this is starting to come out in the headlines too, but you can be sure that working behind the scenes to bring about this final unification, to bring about this final resurrection, is this great church. How else are you going to unite ten nations as we'll see here in just a second, that are so different, divided by so many different things, including languages. How is it going to come together? What's going to be the umbrella that unites it all under one? It's going to be a great church, the great false church that's spoken of over and again in prophecy. You see, religion is what brings it all together. We've talked before about this system, the king of the north, and the clash that happens between the king of the north in Europe and the king of the south. Uh, being radical Islam, both of those movements motivated by religion. Notice Daniel 2 here in verse 40. It says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So here again, this is referring to the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire. Verse 41 says, And whereas you saw the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it uh, of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now in this case, the ten toes are not talking about ten successive kingdoms, but rather they're talking about ten contemporaneous kings that rise together as part of that final resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. It will be a short-lived resurrection. You can see because of the makeup. There's that iron-like strength that the Roman Empire is known for, but it's mixed together with this very soft substance that is the clay. And so it's an unsteady mixture. It, it's not going to be durable enough to remain for many, many, many years or decades. It's just a short-lived emergence. These ten toes are the United States of Europe, the final resurrection of the Roman Empire. Notice verse 43, it says, And whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Let me just read that to you from the Revised Standard Version. It's a little clearer in that translation. It says, As you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix 
with clay. It will come together in this marriage, but it won't hold for very long. Now, that's exactly what we're seeing. People look at commentators on this side and in Europe. They look at what's happening, some of them. They look at what's happening in Europe and they say, oh, the EU is doomed to failure. The Euro is doomed to failure. And of course, the Bible speaks of this turmoil that we're seeing. And we know that there's going to be this near fatal event that happens in Europe because we know it has to go from 27 nations down to 10. So that's the real significance of all that we're seeing play out there. It doesn't mean that Europe is done or Europe is finished or if the Euro crashes, it doesn't mean that the beast isn't going to emerge. What it means is that there's just going to be a stronger, uh, more fit 10 nations that come together. And we're seeing the beginning stages of that. The Bible told us in advance that there'd be this incongruous mix of uh, different nationalities, all of these divergent interests, as I said, that come together for a time. The Bible told us it would be an unsteady mixture of iron and clay, but with religion behind the scenes working to bring it together, and with the emergence of a ruthless dictator who comes again in the spirit of Charlemagne, you can see where this very quickly could become uh, a superpower overnight. Right now, of course, there's lots of problems. It's in economic turmoil. But all of this is leading toward this downsizing of that great European continent to ten nations spearheaded by Germany working together with the Vatican. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This gives you the time element. In the days of these kings, see they're contemporaneous, these ten toes, uh, in, the horn, in the case of the horns in Daniel 7, or you can go over to Revelation uh, 13 and, and uh, 17. There it's speaking of the successive resurrections. But here in Daniel 2, those ten toes are contemporaneous kings that come together in that European combine. They're all there, you see, when that fifth kingdom is set up. I've given a Trumpet Daily program on that subject before, and, and certainly that's a study in and of itself in that God is about to send His Son to this earth to put an end to all of these governments of men and to set up and establish the kingdom of God on earth. I'll get into that perhaps at a, at a later time. But for the purposes of this subject here today, what's really significant in all the turmoil that we see in Europe, besides the fact that Germany is clearly emerging as the powerhouse, leading the way, taking the wheel, is the fact that all of this turmoil is leading to it to about to be downsized to those ten nations. Earlier this month, the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, called on a two-tier Europe. Already, you see, it's been discussed. Two tiers, one with sort of the rich, more prosperous, stronger nations, and the others lagging behind. He said, in the end, clearly there will be two European gears, one gear towards more integration in the Eurozone and a gear that is more confederal in the European Union. Now, it doesn't so much matter what Sarkozy says because we know, really, it's Germany that's going to call the final shot here. But Germany is in support of this. Germany is supporting this movement. Notice what the, the Daily Telegraph wrote, November 10th. France and Germany are understood to want to strengthen the union between Eurozone countries with new taxes and legal measures to stop nations borrowing and spending too much in future. It says weaker countries such as Greece could even be barred from the new Eurozone under radical suggestions from, from some of those involved in discussions over the plan. So they're already talking about squeezing some of them out. Greece has already been threatened that if you don't comply with what we want, you're out. That's something that Germany and others not too long ago said would never happen, could never happen. Now it's being talked about right and left because of the crisis, the economic crisis. Reuters, it quotes a senior EU official as saying this just recently, France and Germany have had intense consultations on this issue over the last months at all levels 
They've been talking about squeezing out some, setting up the two tiers, putting some on the fast track. Intense discussions. That's what Reuters reports. It quotes one official as saying, we need to move very cautiously, but the truth is that we need to establish exactly the list of those who don't want to be part of the club and those who simply cannot be part. They're getting down to specifics here. Who's in and who's out? Now, prophecy has told us the outcome here. The question is, what will you do? How will you react? How will you respond when it's downsized to 10, as we've been saying for decades? We've also been talking, by the way, about Britain being squeezed out. Britain is not going to be part of the final 10. And you just hear that speech I showed you earlier, and you can see the handwriting is on the wall. Already, Germany and Britain are at odds. That's coming out more and more in the headlines as well. The UK is going to be the odd man out. And who will be left? Well, there's going to be 10 kings in the heart of Europe. 10 kings in the heart of Europe, spearheaded by Germany uh, in its union with that great false church. Now, as I said, uh, for more on this story, for much more history and prophecy regarding what's happening right now, call the number on your screen and ask for Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. There's four or five chapters in this lengthy book. It's got wonderful il illustrations and pictures in it as well. But it covers the history of these seven resurrections and tells you where we're headed. The sixth resurrection happened there during the age of World War II, not very long ago. And now we're seeing the emergence of that seventh and final resurrection. It's happening. Call that number on your screen and get this free booklet. We'll send it out to you right away. And when you call, also ask for these two uh, PDF reprints that we've produced here just in the past year or so. The first is a monumental moment in European history. This was from just about a year ago when the EU got its constitution up and running and everybody's on board. And of course now there's just been a whole lot of turmoil since then. But <laughs> we're seeing things happen that Mr. Armstrong talked about 20, 30, 40, even 50 and 60 years ago. And now it's happening. And then this one, this is a little more thorough than, than the other one. The Holy Roman Empire is back. See, going back to that blog post I quoted from earlier, the spirit of Charlemagne, even writers in Europe, in Britain, are talking about that spirit being revived. And that's what we talked about in this booklet. That's what we talked about in those trumpet covers that I've showed you. You look at all that most recent one on Germany dominates Europe again. That's just from a few months ago. And really, we've been right ahead of what's happening all along, right ahead of these events. So when you get this free literature, make sure you become a Trumpet subscriber as well. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you again tomorrow morning.